Oh, way too much intro for this one. Let's take it down a notch. A buddy of mine recently purchased a lake house up in Idaho and his internet and wireless situation is not ideal. So he gave me a call and he said, Chris, can you come down here and make sure that we have amazing solid wireless internet all throughout the property? And I said, absolutely, I love doing that kind of design. I will come out and we will hook you up. However, it's not quite as easy as it sounds because the property is a long property. There's three different structures that we have to cover with wireless and they're at different levels of elevation. So in this video, we're gonna take a look at what he has today, we're gonna to try to design something that's gonna work, and then we're gonna come back and actually implement that design once I get all of the equipment. And we're gonna do all of that while enjoying these gorgeous views of this Idaho Lake House wireless installation. Anytime we're doing a survey of a new property to come up with a wireless design, the best thing to do is to start with what they have already and then build on that if we can or replace it if we have to. So we're gonna start here by talking about their existing internet. Right now, the internet comes in from a local wireless ISP and it comes in from this Microtik point-to-point -point antenna. Right now, they're getting about 12 megabits up and down, however, if you notice, look where this antenna is pointing. <laughs> All right, so not only is it going straight through those trees there, but this thing right here is like a big metal trolley system that goes down to the lower part of the property. This is not ideal placement for a point-to-point -point antenna. That's kind of problem number one. We wanna see if we can improve the line of sight for this wireless ISP or come up with a different solution, which we will talk about in just a bit. From that point-to-point -point antenna, we're coming into the WAN side of this Netgear router, which my buddy bought just as a stopgap until we can get uh, you know, decent wireless put into this place. Now, I will say that this wireless router does sufficiently cover the entire house with Wi-Fi, so I know that if I put another wireless access point in this place, it should be good to cover the whole house without additional access points spread elsewhere in the house, which is nice. This also has a couple of PoE injectors that you can see here. One of them is powering up the point-to-point -point antenna that's just outside the window here. And the second one is powering up a point-to-point -point bridge that takes internet over to the back house. And here we can see the access point side of that point-to-point -point wireless bridge. This thing works fine, but it is not owned and operated by the owner of the property. This is owned and operated by the wireless ISP. So we're gonna wanna replace it with equipment that we have full control over. Now this point-to-point -point bridge goes from here all the way back there to the back house which is probably about 50 yards or so. Here's the other side of that point-to-point -point bridge. And like I said, really simple setup. You can see it's just got a wire going inside the house there, although it doesn't look like there's any sort of sealant or anything uh, on that wire going into the house. So if we replace it, we're definitely gonna have to fix that situation. And here's where that point-to-point -point comes in on the inside of the back house. And as we can see, they just have another Netgear router back here. That point-to-point -point antenna, however, is plugged into the WAN side of this thing. So this router is actually double natted for the wireless back in this area. So I'm gonna try to fix that before I leave, but ultimately when we do the final design, it'll all be one network instead of multiple networks with multiple uh, gateway interfaces. So now we have our starting point. We know what we have in place today, and now we have to figure out where do we wanna to get to. Now it's an interesting setup because of the three different levels. That bottom boathouse, they want to have internet. They want to have good Wi-Fi down there. And that's also the best place to terminate the wireless ISP connection so that it has a clear view across to the other side of the lake where the access point antenna for that connection exists. And also he's going to be putting in Starlink as a secondary internet connection. The internet that he can get today is maximum 30 megabits from a wireless ISP. 
Starlink is made for this type of rural location. However, there aren't really a lot of great spots to put Starlink on the property without it looking aesthetically unpleasing or also being blocked by obstruction such as all of these tall trees around here. He's on the wait list for Starlink, but we have no idea how long that could take. It could be six months, it could be a year, who knows, right? So in the meantime, we're gonna keep the wireless ISP. However, Starlink is going to end up down here at the edge of this dock. It's got a perfectly clear view north, which is generally that way back there. And according to the Starlink app, it's just a perfectly clear view of the sky. So ultimately we're gonna end up with Starlink as well as the wireless ISP as a dual WAN setup. However, you don't necessarily wanna put the router down into in that boathouse. I mean, it could work fine there, but this is a place where they get snow and a lot of snow at different points of the year. That bottom boathouse can very possibly become inaccessible. So if you ever needed to work on the router, you might get locked out of that bottom part of the property. So we don't necessarily want to do that, but we can put a switch down there. So we're going to have to do some fancy work with VLANs, have each of these different WAN connections on their own separate VLANs for terminating into the router that we've chosen for this deployment, which is the UDMSE. Now I chose the UDMSE for a couple of reasons. First of all, it has power over ethernet built in, so we did not have to worry about additional equipment inside the house. And it also provides additional functionality, such as the surveillance stuff, if he did want to upgrade to that in the future. It also can facilitate that dual WAN connection. So starting from the internet down at the bottom boathouse, we're gonna have our dual connections feeding into a US Lite 8 PoE switch, which is going to feed a U6 mesh in that boat house should provide plenty of coverage. We also have the option of adding another access point on the exterior of that boathouse to cover the beachfront area as well as the dock. Which is great. That's going to provide excellent internet to this boathouse, but this boathouse is about 50 feet down a hill from the main house. So at this point we would have internet here in the boathouse, but not up at the main house or the back house. Luckily, there's a pretty interesting feature of this property. This house comes complete with its own railway tram system to get people from the main house down to the boathouse. There's a path too, but one of the advantages of this railway tram system is that it already has electrical conduit running up and down the rails. It's gonna be super easy to just add another piece of conduit, and in my opinion, the best way to get your internet connection from down here at the boathouse to up there at the main house is just to hardwire another connection and run another piece of conduit from the bottom all the way to the top. The conduit, of course, will keep the wire safe from critters and also help protect it from the elements. So we'll have a solid cross connect coming into the UDMSE. Inside the main house is very simple. It's just a single access point. We're gonna use a U6 mesh. I might switch that out to a U6 LR. Again, this is the initial design that we're coming up with, but of course things tend to change. The more difficult part of this job is going to be dealing with not only the back house, but behind the back house, because behind the back house is RV parking, right? Which they also wanna be able to cover in Wi-Fi. So it's not too terribly difficult to get wireless up to the second floor of this house since there's already a point-to-point -point receiver uh, right on the outside of the wall. So I can just reuse this cable that's going through the wall and put up another point-to-point -point that's going to have a small switch and an access point uh, just on the other side of that wall inside. The bigger problem though, of course, is how do you get that wire all the way around the back of the house to where they have some RV parking back here. Uh, he wants to not only have wireless access to this area in general so that it can be picked up from his Airstream over here, but he eventually might want to have another outbuilding out here for RV storage, like an actual RV garage in this sort of area, in which case we'd want like a point to point and you'd want to put it basically on this part of the house right here, either the wireless access point or another point to point antenna that shoots the signal that direction. Instead of doing a point to point, we might do a point to multi point. Reason being is that if we did a point to point, it terminates into the second level of that back house. In order to get cables run around to the back of the back house where the RV parking is, 
it's not gonna look aesthetically pleasing. There's just not a great way to run cables, you know, through the interior of the house. And it's also not an ideal place to run a cable back out and then around the entire house. So instead of dealing with a single point to point connection, it actually makes more sense in this case to do a point to multi-point with two station antennas, one for the interior of the back house and then one for the rear of the back house where we're gonna run a cable along underneath the eave of a roof around to the back side, and then we can have an access point there that will cover that back part of the property, the RV parking, and potentially any future outbuildings that might be located in the back of the house. So as you can see, a lot of this design work is simply putting all of these puzzle pieces together so that you can get your wireless coverage where you want it to be. And typically there's always gonna be a solution, but you have to factor in cost. You have to factor in aesthetics as far as, you know, you don't wanna run wires all over the place. You also don't wanna to poke too many holes through exterior walls and stuff like that, especially out in an area where it snows a lot. So the next stage of this process is to take everything that I learned today and saw firsthand and put it into a design that's going to work to cover everywhere that we need wireless and wired coverage. Then we come up with an equipment list, purchase all that equipment, and I'm gonna have to come back here to do an installation. Welcome to Idaho, everybody. We have spent the last two days solid building out this amazing wireless setup for this lakefront property. And it has not been without its share of challenges. So let me take you on a tour of everything that we set up, the decisions that we made during the process, as well as the challenges that we encountered and how we overcame those challenges. All right, let's hop right to it because the weather could change at any moment. Of course, any wireless installation is going to start with the internet. In this case, we have two sources of internet. We're gonna be using Starlink as well as a local wireless ISP. Let's talk about that local wireless ISP first. Originally, the wireless ISP's antenna, which is this one right above my head here, it's a Mikrotik 2.4 gigahertz point to multi-point station antenna, was located up at the main house, whereas I am at a lower outbuilding, which is this uh, boathouse that you see right behind me, right on the lakefront. Now up at the main house, this 2.4 gigahertz point to point antenna didn't have really clear line of sight to the tower, which exists across the bay here. So we wanted to bring it down here in order to give it the best shot across the water, like perfect line of sight and all of that. Plus I spoke with the owner of the wireless ISP and they're going to be upgrading to five gigahertz very, very soon. And five gigahertz would not have penetrated through the trees like the 2.4 gigahertz did. So if we wanna get any speeds greater than 16 megabits out of this thing, we'd have to go five gigahertz and you couldn't do five gigahertz where the original antenna was placed. The process of mounting this antenna up here was pretty straightforward. We just moved it down, disconnected it. I built this little custom mount for it that you can see right there. And uh, then of course we wired it all along here and then into the bottom portion. This is where they store their uh, kayaks and stuff or in this little uh, bottom portion of the boathouse here. Uh, and then it wires in upstairs, which we're gonna take a look at in just a second. After we moved this dish down here, it was still getting perfect 16 by 16 wireless internet from the wireless ISP, which is to be expected. Uh, it's got now perfect line of sight, so he's getting the absolute max that he's paying for. But once we get that five gigahertz in, he should be able to double those speeds uh, for not much more money. So we'll probably end up doing that. That wireless ISP connection is running as the primary WAN right now, but ultimately it will become the backup WAN connection for this property as we have ordered and actually received a Starlink dish. We're just waiting on the long Starlink cable to come in so that we can wire it 
into the same location that that wireless ISP antenna sits. And that's another reason why we wanted to bring the internet down here to the boathouse as part of this install. Not only do we get clear line of sight for the wireless ISP antenna, but we also get perfect line of sight for the Starlink. As for the Starlink itself, we're going to mount it onto this dock and we had this custom built steel four inch frame uh, as a post built out here on the edge of the dock. Now this part of the dock out here actually goes away for the winter time. So we have it built about halfway down the dock where all year round, this will sit out here. It's a really solid pole solution. And then once we can get the Starlink mounted on top of this pole, that way is generally north. So the Starlink will have a perfect unobstructed view of the sky and get absolutely the best signal that it can possibly get. Once we get that Starlink cable, there's a conduit that starts right under here, runs all the way the length of this dock, goes underneath the sand right here, and then pops up where it's waiting for us to pull the Starlink cable through this conduit uh, right here, at which point it'll be really easy to run a little bit more conduit or just run the cable up underneath here and then into the house where the other wireless ISP internet terminates as well. And here you can see the setup that we have in this boathouse. Now, of course, we have everything on a UPS first because this boathouse is not on the main house's generator backup power. So I wanted to ensure that in any sort of sustained power outage, we can at least keep this up for a limited amount of time. Plugged into this UPS, we have the PoE injector for the Microtik wireless ISP antenna. It's 24 volt passive. And then of course, we also have our US8 light PoE switch right here from Ubiquiti Inc. Uh, plugged into that switch, we have the two WAN connections, a cross connect that goes up to the main house. And then we also have this U6 mesh access point that's providing wireless coverage for this boathouse. We also have the option of adding another access point down here if we wanna put one out to cover the dock and beach area. Now you guys might be saying, Chris, how are you running two separate WANs as well as an access point that's on the LAN and a cross connect that's on the LAN all into this one switch? Well, we did that with some fancy VLAN work and I'll show you that in just a bit when we actually dig into Unify. Now, in order to get the cross connect down to this switch from the main house, that was one of the more challenging aspects of this install. In order to do that, we needed to make a really long Cat6 ethernet run from here all the way up to the main house. So let's take a look at how we did that next. Running thick outdoor rated Cat6 cable through a conduit is never an easy job and certainly this was no exception. It was the part of this job that I personally was looking forward to the least. Luckily though, we had a lot of help and one of our really good buddies, Darren, who's an amazing electrician and also just a great jack of all trades, had already run the conduit up this rail line before we got here and he was on hand to help with a lot of this stuff, including drilling up under the floor, running the conduit and, uh, and all sorts of amazing things that I didn't wanna have to do myself. There was already an existing electrical conduit and we basically just piggybacked onto it. You can kind of see the conduit piece right here stacked on top of the other piece of conduit. That worked out just great and actually was not too difficult to do the actual pull. It's on its way. All right, I think I just heard it. You got it? No, not yet. All right, still got plenty of slack. String still coming through? Yeah, still got plenty. All right, so it's like almost at the end of the rule, rule, reel here. I'm holding on to it so it doesn't all go in. Okay. Uh, it's possible that the ball got stuck somewhere and the string was just being sucked through. That's possible. Should I uh, start reeling it back? Oh yeah, I got it. <laughs> oh good. It got all tangled up here. Uh, do you want me to sort of start reeling it up till it's taut? Yeah. All right. I'm pulling. It's already taut right there, right? Oh, yeah. I can feel you. All right. Tie the wire on. All right. Let me tie this off first so it doesn't go anywhere. All right. We're good. I'm going to start feeding in or go ahead and start pulling, but gently. Gently and slowly. All right. It's in the hole. That's what she said. <laughs> 
Oh, I think we just hit a bend. It slowed down for a second. Yeah, it should go smooth. It's all downhill. I put some Vaseline on it. And there's only 145. It worked out quite well, didn't it? It actually did work out pretty well. Well, let's get it actually all the way through, then we'll say that. Yeah, don't jinx us. Knock on wood. <laughs> Hold on. <laughs> uh, it's almost here. I feel like it should be at the end of the dock by now. <laughs> I have it. You all got right, it? Hooray. All right, how much do we need to pull through down there? Or how much more do you want to pull through? You're going to do the, right where that 90 is, it's going to go right underneath you, under the deck, and then into the house. And I would just pull enough to go all the way across to the other uh, corner of the house. And maybe another five feet more, or do you want to have enough to move it downstairs just in case? Yeah, yeah, like for the more the better. We so have go, to the, go to the corner of the house and maybe pull another 20 feet. Working inside a crawl space is never fun, but luckily this place has a crawl space that's actually pretty decent, so it wasn't too difficult to work in, other than the occasional back soreness from being hunched over for an hour while we're trying to do this. So here you can see where the conduit comes up from the boathouse. This is where it terminates in the crawl space, and we also have another pull string that we pulled through with the Cat6 outdoor ethernet so that if we ever need to make a change to the cable or pull additional cables through the same conduit, we already have the pull string run and ready to go. That Cat6 then was strapped up to the roof of the underside of the floor here, where we had to run it all the way through this crawl space to the other side of the house. On the other side of the house, we took the ethernet cable out of this vent, making sure that we siliconed up any holes that we made. Along the bottom of the board here, up the side of the drain pipe, and then in through the wall where we have the router. You'll also notice a point to multi-point antenna right there, which we'll talk about in just a little bit. On the other side of the wall, those cables terminate into the router, which is in this small lockable for you rack. Again, lockable so that no one can mess with the internet or the cables that we've set up. And by far the most challenging aspect of this job was something totally unexpected. The cable, the Cat6 outdoor ethernet shielded cable that I purchased because this property has weather extremes that can get down pretty low. Historical temperatures have been down to as low as negative 30 degrees. So I wanted to make sure any ethernet that I put in would stand up to whatever nature could throw at it. But the cable that I purchased was a little bit different than any other cable that I've ever worked with, in that the individual strings of ethernet in the cable had a coating on them that was a little bit thicker than anything I've ever experienced, meaning that all of the ends that I had to terminate to were very difficult to terminate. I tried for literally an hour on one connection trying to get an end or multiple different ends to actually pass through so that I could crimp it down and then test it out properly. A number of times we were able to get both sides terminated, but then our testing tool showed one or some other cable just not connected properly. It was giving us all sorts of problems. So we ended up calling in the local wireless ISP that owns that 2.4 gigahertz antenna down at the boathouse, and a wonderful guy by the name of Aaron came in and was able to save the day and get those links terminated. I mean, we were basically running out of supplies, and this is an area where you can't just run down to the local hardware store to get ethernet connectors, to get shielded Cat6 ethernet connectors. It's just not something that you can get at the spur of the moment. So luckily, thank you very much to Aaron who came in, saved the day, got both ends of that long cable terminated, and we were good to go. And here is a look at that for you rack. All in all, I like this rack. I'll put a link to all of the products that I use in this video down in the description below. Now the rack is just fine, but the fan on top of the rack is annoyingly loud. So we just did not connect that fan. This is a climate controlled space, so it shouldn't really be an issue. Inside the rack, we have a surge protector, which will ultimately be replaced with a UPS at some point. That's why we have some spare space down at the bottom and we have our UDM SE. Now he's not using the Unify Protect aspect of the UDM SE, but this was a really great choice because of the PoE that comes out of the switch, as well as the dual WAN capabilities. Having that PoE means that we didn't have to have a separate PoE switch up here, and it's a nice small 1U rack mount form factor. Coming out of the UDM SE, we have a number of things, including 
our 802.3 AF to 24 volt PoE adapter, which powers up the access point side of the point to multi-point bridge that we're gonna talk about next, as well as like, you know, some miscellaneous IoT like this Lutron light controller, and then an interior access point as well as our dual WANs. How did we take two separate internet connections as well as a LAN connection down here in the boathouse and run them into a switch before it ever hits the router up at the main house. Well, we did that with some fancy VLAN work. Let me show you how I did it in Unify. So from within Unify Network, the first thing I did was come over here to Settings, and then we click on Networks. Now, within Networks, I created two brand new networks that are VLAN-only networks. A primary WAN running on VLAN ID 3, and a backup WAN running on VLAN ID 4. Now when you say VLAN only network, you basically just mean a network that can pass VLAN traffic, but it doesn't have its own separate subnet or DHCP server or DNS settings or anything like that. It's literally just a VLAN that the switch knows about so that it can pass that traffic you know, around the network. Now that I have my VLAN set up, I went over here to devices and I clicked on the Boathouse 8 port switch. In the switch settings, I clicked on port 7, and I set the port profile of port 7 to be that primary WAN VLAN ID 3. Then I went over to port 8, and I set the port profile for port 8 to be the backup WAN VLAN ID 4. So essentially what that means is anything that you plug into either port 7 or 8 is going to be the corresponding primary or backup WAN. And since those are now untagged ports in the switch, those switch ports only carry those specific VLANs traffic. The cross connect from this switch down here up to the main house carries all of the VLANs, right? So in that case, I now went up to the UDMSE and likewise, I set port seven to be port profile primary WAN only, and I set port eight to be port profile backup WAN only. And in doing this, I kept everything uniform where port seven down here, as well as up in the main house is the primary WAN, port eight down here and up in the main house is the backup WAN. So essentially, I isolated the traffic from both the primary and backup WAN networks to those specific VLANs, which has now been isolated to those specific ports. Once I'm up at the UDMSE, it's then simply a matter of cross-connecting port 7 to the primary WAN port and port 8 to the backup WAN port. So here we can see the WAN wiring. I'm coming out port seven, which is VLAN seven. That goes into the primary WAN, which corresponds to all of the same down at the boathouse. Then I have port eight, which is the backup WAN. This one is not connected yet because I need the RJ45 SFP to plug into this port right here. It's the one thing that I forgot to bring with me. So I'm just gonna send it up here. Uh, the owner of the house will plug that in, plug this in, and then he'll be completely ready to go with both a primary and backup WAN connection into this UDMSE. Let's talk about the point to multi-point connection for the back house. Now, instead of running a physical hard wire, it had perfect line of sight, a really short shot, and it was the easiest solution to get internet to two spots in the back house. We decided to use NanoBeam ACs for the point to multi-point connection. And since they're only 24 volt passive, we had to get these adapters. I'll have a link down below in the description for these if you're interested. These take 802.3 AF power in and then push 24 volt passive power out. They're actually really handy to have. I always have a couple spares of these in my network bag. This nano beam right here is the access point side of our point to multi-point wireless bridge. You can see that we also painted it black with some plasti dip. Now it's okay to paint these devices so they're just not a big white dot on the side of the house that causes an eyesore. We use plasti dip for this one. 
Just make sure when you do that painting, you're not using any sort of metal-based paint that can interfere with the radio signal. The access point side then shoots its beam all the way across the driveway here. It's about a, you know, 100 foot shot to the back house where we have two different station antennas picking up that point to multi-point signal. And here's one of the receiving stations for the point to multi-point wireless bridge. Again, we're using the NanoBeam AC. We painted it black with the Plastidip but we had to use this box here. So we have essentially this camera's power connections as well as two PoE injectors inside that box, creating a tiny small network without the need to have a network switch. So from the NanoBeam AC, we're plugging into a 24 volt passive PoE injector. The LAN side of that injector goes into the LAN side of a, an 802.3 AF PoE injector, which then the power from that goes all the way down the side here and terminates to this U6 mesh access point that we put a little service loop into, as well as a drip loop, painted it black just like the other stuff so that it disappears. Actually though, it looks like we kinda need to touch that one up a little bit. I'll hit that next. This U6 mesh is then out here in the backyard and able to cover the RV parking as well as any additional structures that might end up in this area. Right here we have the second station antenna picking up the signal from the point to multi-point access point. Uh, we were able to reuse the existing wiring from the previous point-to-point -point network connection that was already servicing this back house. And so we reused that wire, which was already poked through the wall, uh, although it didn't have any silicone or anything, so we did seal it up a bit uh, once we were finished. And that goes inside to service the uh, sort of whole back house here uh, with wireless that we'll take a look at next. Into the upstairs apartment through the wall, we cable managed this as best we could underneath the the floor trim piece here. Uh, we also ran power into this little cabinet right here, which is where we have all of the rest of the equipment. So we delivered a power socket right here, and then we have the US8 light PoE switch that is servicing this U6 mesh access point, and then we have another one of those 802.3 AF to 24 volt passive PoE converters for the nano beam. Now there's plenty of capacity left in this switch for more PoE devices or fanning out network cables to wherever we might need them in this back apartment. Taking a look at our point to multi-point connection, we can see here that our link capacity looks really good. We've got about 345 megabits to each one of the receiving stations. And it should be a really good connection because it's just about a hundred foot or so point to multi-point link going through perfect line of sight. So these radios are absolutely bulletproof. This should last a long, long time. Let's take a quick look at Unify. Here we can see that currently, our, we're testing out the Starlink connection directly into the primary WAN, even though we don't have that long cable yet. And we can see that our internet is currently down, but hopefully that will be remedied very soon. Looking at the overall topology here, we can see how everything is set up according to Unify. We have our UDM SE as the primary router, fanning out to the various switches, this access point, then we have the access point side of our point to multi-point wireless bridge. We have our U6 mesh, which doesn't really know what it's connected to according to Unify, because remember, it just goes through to the station side point to multi-point and then into those PoE injectors and out to that device. But it does not show as isolated, it does show as a wired device. Unify just doesn't know about that point to point connection. And if we expand any of the stuff in here, we can see all of the clients that are currently connected. And we're in the process of making sure that all of the IoT devices in this house are securely on this network. If we look at our device view here, we can see that all of our devices are looking really, really good. The Wi-Fi experience doesn't look spectacular right now, but again, that's because we've been doing a lot of testing and switching things around this morning. I expect that that will improve once everything is stable. As far as wireless networks go, everything is is very simple. We have a secure network that's going to be for all of the IoT devices and sort of household stuff. And then there's going to be a guest network for any guests that are here. Now, typically for my own house, I would have all of the IoT devices segregated into their own separate network. But this is someone who's using this house essentially as an Airbnb. And so we want to make it as simple as possible. I'm not going to be here to administer this thing all the time, right? And it's a 10 hour drive for me to get out here. So I wanna make sure that it remains as solid as possible. 
All right, there you have it, a completed rock solid wireless network for this complicated lake house property in this stunningly beautiful location. What do you guys think? Was there anything that you would have done differently? Let me know down in the comments below. Also, down in the description, there is a link to all of the products that I used in this video. And of course, some of those are affiliate links. If you click on those links, it does not change your price at all, but it's absolutely the best way to support Crosstalk Solutions so that we can continue to make instructional videos just like this one. Thank you guys so much for watching, and we will see you in the next video. Thank you.